One of the uh, things that we found interesting, and I was just sharing with uh, the folks here, was the beautiful mysteries that are hidden in the Bible, and hidden under the sands of time. And to reach and look and meditate allows you to see things that are quite astonishing. So if you'll follow me up here, um, I'll show, share something with you. Uh, back in the book of Numbers, in Numbers 2, they set up the tribes of Israel, playing the, placing the tribe of Dan in the north, the tribe of Ephraim and uh, Reuben in the south, the tribe of Ephraim in the west, and the tribe of Judah in the east at the point of the rising sun. But Judah represents, as you look north, the east is on the right side, representing the right hemisphere. And of course, out of Judah comes the Christ, the God's chosen people who dwell at the right side, uh, the point of light. And we always know of Jesus being that which is I am, that which is the light of the world, portraying that which is Christ consciousness within each one of us. But the point we want to focus on is light, I am, the light of the world, coming from the east side, coming out of the tribe of Judah. Well, there's a very interesting thing that is placed by the Creator in that scripture, which we'll share with you. And, and I think it identifies, without any doubt, the scientific reality of all this, because as we understand that the speed of light and the identification of light is 186,400. If you get your Bible out and you look at um, Numbers 2, Numbers 2 and verse 9, okay, and there it identifies the tribe of Judah. All that were numbered in the camp of Judah were 100,000 and four score thousand. Four score is four times 20, so that's 80. So you got 100,000 and four score thousand. That's 100,000 and 80,000 and 6,000. So that's 186,000 and 400, okay? So there, as you look at it, the speed of light at the point of light, the light of the world, that which is out of the tribe of Judah in the east, that which is in the right hemisphere. And there you have a scientific mystery hidden in that Bible, numbering the tribe at 186,400, or the speed of light. That's really an interesting thing, okay? And we just threw that in, no extra charge. Right, Albert? That's great. But that's, that is very, very interesting. But let's pick up now at the book of Revelation, and we're at Revelation 22, and verse 4. We are closing in on the end of the book of Revelation. <clears throat> Revelation 22 and verse 4. And they, meaning those who lift themselves into this place of the higher realm of consciousness, shall see his face and his name shall be in their forehead. Now, that is a reference to the single eye. <laughs> We have someone here, a very sweet person, who's, and guess where it is? Right smack in the middle of her forehead. And it sure does. Look. Would you mind, to show, would you like everybody on television to see that? Come on, why not? Come on, Claire. Why don't you get a picture of Claire over here? And we, I, I mean, she'll do anything for this church, but that's a little ridiculous. Can you, can you see her over there? Elle? Oh, there, can you get, now there, there it is, right there. She got a little bruise right in the middle of her forehead, okay? And that's the single eye. <laughs> That's what we're talking about. The, the, the single eye, well, anything to get on TV, right, Claire? Why not? Okay. They shall see his face, and his name shall be in their forehead. All right. So if we're talking about the single eye, also by the ancients and the knowledge of the ancients, the pineal gland, or also known as the pineal gland of the brain. Now, if you, you can look in dictionaries and so forth, and you'll find that the ancients regarded that pineal gland as the single eye. So there should be then a connection between the two. And we see in Revelation 22, 4, they shall see his face, and his name shall be in their forehead. Now, there's something to understand when you look at the word name, OK? In the Bible, these things take on different meanings. And we said this morning, which is appropriate, the word bull means a big animal that snorts and scrapes its hoofs and charges and it's got horns. But in our vernacular, it means talk, conversation. Shoot the bull means let's have a conversation. It has nothing to do with the animal. 
Okay? Beans means information. He spilled the beans. Now, beans has nothing to do with information, but when used in symbolism, it does. The color green is the color green, but when you say, ah, he's just a green kid, it means it takes on the meaning in experience. Okay? The word name does not mean name. It means way. It means the way that you do something. That's where people have made such a serious mistake in praying in Jesus' name. Well, they say, I do this in Jesus' name, and they walk off thinking they'd obey the scriptures. No way. <laughs> That's right, no way. What it means is in the way that Jesus instructed you to go. And Jesus said, if your eye be single, then if you're going to do it in his name, you're going to do it in his way. You're going to practice that which is the single eye. Then you're moving in his way. So when you look at this in Revelation 22, 4, it says, they shall see his face and his name or his way shall be in their forehead. Well, the premise that we're giving here is that his way is the activation of the pineal or the pineal gland of the brain, and that certainly would be appropriate to say it's in the forehead or in that part, that higher part of your brain, or that which is your consciousness. In Matthew 6.22, go to page 5 in the New Testament of your little Bible, and if you look at Matthew 6.22, you'll see what it says. Page 5 in those little Bibles and Matthew 6, verse 22. Let's get off the ground and let me show you this so that you can see. Matthew 6, verse 22, The light of the body is the eye. If, if therefore thine eye be single, thy whole body shall be full of what? Light. And then what we did see a little while ago, Jesus out of the tribe of Judah, which marked 186,400, which is the identification of that which is the speed of light. Okay? So your whole being will fill with this light which means the onrushing cosmic universal understanding that comes through the cosmos and attracts that to the pineal or pineal gland of the brain. So we see then the single eye attracting that which is light, and we're referring as the pineal or pineal gland of the brain. Okay, go back to the first book of the Bible, page 29 in your, in your uh, little Bibles in the Old Testament, and go to the book of Genesis, book of Genesis, and you'll look at Genesis 32 and verse 30. Now remember in Revelation 22, 4, it says, They shall see his face, and his way or name shall be in their foreheads. Well, we're saying it's the pineal or pineal gland of the brain, which is being referred to as being in the forehead as a point of reference. And in Genesis 32, 30, here is the patriarch Jacob having wrestled with himself. And now it says, And Jacob called the name of the place Pineal, for I have seen God face to face, and my life is preserved. There, they shall see his face, Revelation 22, 4, and his name or way shall be in the forehead. So there, the pineal gland of the brain is what's being referred to. The point of reference to it would be at the forehead, the point of the single eye. And here then, Jacob says, because of this pineal or pineal, he sees God face to face. And that's exactly here then what the Bible is telling you. So here the, the forehead is always the symbol of the center of consciousness, and the Bible in the book of Revelation is specifically telling you the reference point. To see God face to face is to totally understand the existence and to be one with God, and the reference point to your forehead means it is that which is consciousness located in your brain, and that single eye, which Jesus talked about being the activation of the pineal or pineal gland, as Jacob taught back in the book of uh, Genesis and Genesis 32 that we just looked at. Now, okay, his name shall be in their foreheads, all right? And let's take a look at that. So that means the way is in your forehead or the way is in your brain or in your mind. The entire thing is consciousness, and that's what it's saying. Well, forehead can have two aspects to it. It can be a lower aspect of the lower mind. It can be a higher aspect of the divine mind. So let me run and let's play uh, a little bit of jump around on the Bible here, but let's see some stuff. On page 393 in those little Bibles, and if the rest of you go to uh, a book that we don't get into too often, but it's called Second Chronicles, okay? Second Chronicles and go to chapter 26. In those little Bibles, it's on page 393. 
2 Chronicles chapter 26. And let me show you a mystical reference to one whose life was wasting away. 2 Chronicles chapter 26, and now go to verse 19. Okay? Then Uzziah was wroth, angry, and had a censer in his hand to burn incense. And while he was wroth with the priest, the leprosy even rose up in his forehead before the priest in the house of the Lord. Basically, what's being talked about there is this wasting away, uh -huh, this, this absolutely losing of the life force, this wasting away of the life force, which was coming from his consciousness. So in other words, the leprosy in the forehead is simply a mystical way of speaking about things were just being eaten away, things were eating him away. You know, there are many times that you feel like, you know, I just, ooh, I'm being eaten away, you know, I, I, just coming at you from all different directions. Well, when you feel that way consciously, and you have that kind of feeling coming out of your mind, it's leprosy in the forehead. That's the way that these ancients are going to refer to that. Let's take a look at uh, page 252 in your little Bibles, and the rest of you go to 1 Samuel. Page 252 in your little Bibles, the rest of you go to 1 Samuel and go to chapter 17, okay? So there we have a leprosy in the forehead, which means that that which is life, that which is understanding and wisdom, there is an eating away of it. I mean, you're just falling to pieces. So why is I'm falling apart, you know, nothing, nothing's working. 1 Samuel chapter 17, and it's on page 252 in your little Bibles. And if in 1 Samuel chapter 17, you'll go to verse 49. This is the story of David and Goliath, okay? And it said, and David put his hand in his bag, took a stone and slang it, and smote the Philistine in his forehead that the stone sunk into his forehead and he fell upon his face to the earth. That stone is, the, again, a reference to the pineal gland of the brain, the stone that the builders rejected, and he slings that. It was one of the five stones when he took control of the five senses. When he slings that, he strikes the beast in the forehead so then again, you have the symbol of consciousness, okay? If you're going to come against the beast, you've got to come against it on a conscious level. It's the same thing that we're seeing in this Iraq war and all of this stuff. All of these things, all of these terrible weapons have been devised out of the mind of man. People thought these things up. It's the beast who dwells in the forehead. It's that which dwells in the consciousness of man. And here in destroying the beast, David smacked him in the forehead. And he had to take the five smooth stones, which means he took control of his five senses. If you lose uh, and you only take four, you might be something you said or something you saw that will do you in and you'll not be able to overcome the power of the beast, okay? Let's take a look at page 624 in your little Bibles, and the rest of you go to the book of Jeremiah, okay? Jeremiah. We'll just, I'm trying to get you to see how these words are used symbolically in the Bible uh, as they relate to uh, consciousness. Page 624 in the Little Bibles, the rest of you go to Jeremiah, and let's go to Jeremiah chapter 3, okay? Now, there's a, there's a reason here. What is your consciousness supposed to involve you in? Your consciousness is supposed to involve you in a spiritual intercourse with Christ, remember? Jesus is the bridegroom. That means the Christ consciousness comes. You rise up into that high room and intercourse with the Christ. Therefore, the seed is implanted in you, which grows from the virgin womb of Christ consciousness. That's the, the, the story, the myth behind how this evolves in us um, anatomically, if you would. If you look in Jeremiah 3, verse 3, therefore the showers have been withholden. That means the blessing. Showers are water or truth which comes down from the higher mind. There is none. There has been no latter rain, okay? And that latter rain is a Buddhic principle of the same thing, of that which comes down from the higher consciousness. And thou has a whore's forehead. You refuse to be ashamed. Simply meaning that you are consciously intercoursing with anything that will come from whichever direction from the lower mind. You're eating it up, you're just exposing yourself to it, you're letting it penetrate deep within you, and it's causing you all kinds of hell because you will not save yourself 
for that which is the higher. That's what most people find the trouble is. They will not save themselves for the intercourse of meditation. Instead, they're taking everything which comes from the lower. And when you intercourse with the lower, it said you have a, a, a whore's forehead because you need to take this information and that information from the lower mind, your lower mind and other lower minds, is what causes you trouble and keeps you separated from that which is Christ. A whore's forehead. So we had leprosy, we had David slaying the Goliath in the forehead. We have a reference to a whore's forehead. And I guess the most famous one that you know that we talk about consciousness is portrayed on page 234 in your little Bible. And back to where we started this whole thing in Revelation chapter 14. And I guess this is probably uh, the, the one that we know most of all. Revelation chapter 14 and verse 9. And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast at his image and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, which is, the, which is a place of energy. The hand is a place of energy. And, uh, and then, then, of course, we understand that that mark of the beast or that number of the beast, which is implanted in the forehead, is 666. And when you take 6, 6, 6, and you add 6 plus 6 plus 6, it equals 18. And 1 plus 8, 1 plus 8 equals 9, which is the number of consciousness. And so they're talking about that which is in the forehead, that which is in the consciousness of all of us. When you understand that, the mark of the beast in the forehead, and then you see it, you see? You're looking at people firing missiles, blowing people up. People are polluting, uh, you know, the scud missiles and these missiles, and everybody's firing guns and slaughtering each other. The mark of the beast is in the forehead. It's, it's, that's, that's exactly what it is. It's exactly what it is. It's, it portrays them because it's consciousness which has reached that point of depravity. Regardless of how I think I may be justified, I'm still swinging out in a violent, horrible way. Okay? So there, then, is that symbol. And so we saw it in Genesis where Jacob said, I have seen God face to face, which matches Revelation 22, 4, which we started with tonight, and that says they shall see face to face, okay? They shall see his face, and his name or his way shall be in their forehead. So if you're following his way, okay, as it says in Revelation 22, 4, where we started tonight, if you're following his way, you will see him face to face. In other words, you will have wisdom you will have enlightenment, you will have understanding, and it will be because the pineal gland of the brain has been activated by your meditation. And that's what, that's what the single eye is all about. Now let's take a look at Revelation 22.5 and see something I think that should put to rest the literalness of a heaven. You know, I saw a guy on Christian television last night, and he was saying there is a place called heaven on a planet and there is another place called hell and another planet. And his grandpa, Leroy, is a little guy with a cane and a bald head. And Grandpa Leroy is up in heaven. And when he dies, he's going to see Grandpa Leroy. And he's, you know, it's Disneyland. And it is totally wrecking what this is. If Gr Grandpa Leroy is no longer got a cane, and no, God knows, but Grandpa Leroy has found his way into another woman's womb, and he is acting out his life in a beautiful way, maybe playing soccer somewhere. This, I mean, the lunacy of looking forward to a physical type of a heaven instead of understanding that we'll never, ever, ever have a physical heaven unless we first find and touch that which God instructs us about the spiritual heaven within us. Revelation 22.5. There shall be no night there, no need of candle, no light of the sun, for the Lord God gives them light. Okay? And we saw the place where the Lord God comes from with that light, from the tribe of Judah, simply placed on the east side or the right hemisphere, where the count is 186,400, or the speed of light. Okay? What more or clearer description can you have to know for sure that heaven is not a physical place. There will be no night. There is not going to be any need for candle. There's not going to be any light of the sun, OK? Now, the physical eyes cannot see without a candle. I want to demonstrate this for you. 
And I am going to come down here and stand. And Elliot, if you would, would you go in and turn off some of the lights? Okay? And I want to show you what I'm talking about. And I, and I think probably you've seen this before. All the way. Just go with the whole kit and caboodle. There you go. Lights are going down. Stay with it on television. Folks, got two more to go. Okay, turn it out completely. Now, what I want you to do is look in your Bible at Isaiah 42, 3, and read it to me. Okay? You can't do it. All right, come back up. Elliot, quick for the television. Those, there we are. Hello, everybody. Knock them all on. What I'm trying to tell you is physical eyes need light. Physical eyes need sun. You've got to have, you've got to have, it says there's not going to be any night there. You're going to be up forever. I'm getting tired thinking of it. Who wants to go there? You're not ever going to take a nap. We could say, would somebody turn out this light? I got to rest. Well, physical bodies must sleep. And you've got to have night. The whole idea of nature is you know, somebody's got, did you put the Bat Conversation Society up there? All right, bats have got to have night for them to come out. What's going to happen to them if there's going to be no night? How did you go with you? I had an idea. <laughs> hey, why not? I don't have nothing. What's going to happen to frogs and all those things? Owls, what? Don't owls go to heaven? And imagine the owl gets up, hoo, hoo, hoo. Where does the night come? It doesn't. Hoo, 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 hoo. What is this? So it's silliness. It's silliness. This is simply saying if there's no night there, no sun there, no candle there, then forget about being in a physical place. It's not a physical place. This is a divine place. It's a place of consciousness. See? Now, what does it say in Revelation 22? 5? The Lord gives them light. What does it mean? Matthew 6, 22, we looked at before. If your eye be single, your body fills with light. Wisdom understanding, enlightenment, see? And if you go up into your holy place, when you're in meditation, okay, you will see there is no light of the sun there. There is no candle there. There is nothing there. But you become enlightened. You become in where? Where did the light come from? Where did the... The Lord gives you light in here where there is no light. There is no need of nighttime because there is nothing there but nothingness. But the Lord gives you, that in that place of nothingness where there is no physical light, there is no physical sun, there is no physical candle, there is no physical night, in that place of nothingness is where God gives you light. God gives you wisdom and understanding and enlightenment. Okay? I guess it is. Okay. And where it means there is no night. Do you see that? No night. That means no darkness. No fear. No guilt, no hate, no distress and oppression and, and stress and all of that stuff. So the light overwhelms the darkness. Right. Darkness is not in and of itself anything but the absence of light. And where there is light, there can be no darkness. So you go into that holy place in your meditation. There is no light physical. There is no sun physical. There is no night physical. There is absolutely nothingness, and in that nothingness, you are filled with light, wisdom, understanding, enlightenment, awareness. And that's further proof of the fact that there is no physical heaven. It's totally consciousness. See? I, I mean, you, you can't even conceive of a human being, physical flesh and blood body, going to the place where there's no sunshine. Okay? And I mean... The Lord's going to give you the light, but wonder if he's out of town. Where, you know, if he's not out of town, he's going to hang around you all the time. You're going to get sick. Will you stop with the light already? The guy might glow. Well, that's all the silliness that we come up with simply to try to say, don't be silly and understand what the Bible's trying to tell you. This is divine consciousness. If you are going to exist, there will always be a body for you Forever and ever and ever, there will be new bodies given to you. Maybe someday, in the day of pure nirvanic enlightenment, the body will live for eons and eons and eons, like they did in the old days. They lived six, seven, eight hundred years, thousands of years, whatever, because of this enlightenment that they had. But we lost all that. We fell, see, because of our refusal, and it's worse than it ever was, our refusal to 
touch that which is light. And so, but you'll, you'll always have to have a physical body, wherever you go. And that means you have to live in an environment where there is sun and all of these types of things, because it's all part of God's way. And that's beautiful. So you'll always be that. Your spirit is wonderful, but your spirit will always need to communicate and be in a physical body. Now, don't take me into the eons where you go in and come out no more. I don't know. I don't know what goes on in the stratospheric universal ionosphere, whatever goes on up there. they got something else going. That's fine. I mean, we can sit and start to discuss it with our little pea brains, but, you know, who knows what's possible. Okay? Revelation 22.5 says, They shall reign forever and ever. Okay? Revelation 22.5. They shall reign forever and ever. That means you will simply reign over what? You will reign over yourself. You will be totally in control of yourself instead of yourself being in control of you. And when you are in control of yourself, you will not worry about them. See, that's the critical point in our whole existence. How do we maneuver ourselves so we are not subject to them and worrying about what they say and what they think and because nobody even knows who they are. But the point is, you will be totally in control and you will be guided by that light from that higher realm of consciousness, which is a beautiful, beautiful thing. Revelation 22, 6. We're moving right along to the end of the book. We're not going to be here till the end of the book tonight, I'm afraid to tell you, but... And he said unto me, These sayings are faithful and true. And that means that indeed the physical realm has nothing to do with heaven. Do you remember those of you who sat here this morning? One of the most amazing things were these guys who were Bible scholars, the Sadducees. They knew the Bible. They knew the law. They knew the scriptures inside and out, every bit of it. And when they came to Jesus and asked him about the seven brides and the seven brothers, Jesus Christ looked at them and said, fellas, you're wrong. And the reason you're wrong is because you don't understand the scriptures. You're taking that which is mystical literally. One of the interesting things I caught this morning to Albert, which was very, very interesting to me, is they referred to him as master. And when you talk about a master, you're talking about a guru. And that's exactly the way they addressed him. Very interesting, because that indeed was what he was. And so here then, we go back to what we covered this morning in 1 Corinthians 15, 5. You don't have to change that or go after that now. Flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, and corruption cannot inherit incorruption. No human body can live forever. It is corruption. It deteriorates. But incorruption is that which is spirit. Incorruption is that which is really us, and we inherit eternity. The body cannot. The body cannot. Okay? And says, these sayings are true. In Revelation 22, 6, also it says, And he said unto me, these sayings are faithful and true. And the Lord God of the holy prophets sent his angel to show unto his servants the things which must shortly be done. So that's why you're here. That's why you're watching this on television. Because you have had an inner impulse, a thought has come down and instructed you about a new way. There are some, and there's many people that come here, that this would have been the last thing they could conceive they would have ever listened to. It is as far away from what they had heard before as night is from day. And yet it's interesting. It begins to make sense. All of a sudden, this begins to make sense. All of a sudden, they say, gee, this is me. I mean, I'm part of this. All of a sudden, I find the Christ Jesus dwells inside of me. The kingdom of God is inside of me. That everything, all bets are off, all possibilities now exist because if I start to understand these things, if I look at that and see 186,400, wow, I've understood that there was a secret coded message in that book telling me that with the speed of light, I will be enveloped if I move myself to the right side. You see, you were talking earlier about... Uh, I forget what, exactly how you put it, but you were talking about the Iraqis or the prayers of the Eastern people. One of the interesting things, and you were talking about the magic carpet they ride on the carpet in their spirit in meditation. One of the also interesting things is that what they would do, and you've seen Saddam Hussein do this on television. 
they will get on their knees, bow their face down to the floor. That means they are humbling their own ego. They are meditating. They are separating from human thought, and they bow to the east, which means they direct their energies to the right side. Do you see what I'm saying to you? What did Jesus say? Take no thought, bow your face down, and cast your net to the right side. And so you see that acted out, and you see these people bowing down to the floor and facing east. Now that's a physical thing. I have no need to think that in a physical realm, but I'm not going to question it because it acts out a feeling. But spiritually and psychically, if you would, you must do the same thing. You must get on your knees. You must humble yourself to shut down your own instinct. You must bow your face down. You must separate from your own thoughts. And you must face the east. You must direct your energies to the right hemisphere of the brain. And that's what you, when you, when you see these people do that, that's why they do it. And doggone it, your Bible, your American Bible, or whatever you want to call this thing, is loaded to the gills with stuff about the light comes from the east, God dwells in the east, the star came from the east, the wise men came from the east. Why did the wise men come from the east to Jesus? Because wisdom comes from the right side. Wisdom comes from the right side. That's all it was telling you. It wasn't three, three guys traveling. All, that's irrelevant. See? They didn't have to even exist. The story didn't even have to be real. Who cares? And I can't prove it. You can't prove it. But it is true because it happens in here. It doesn't have to happen over there. It happens in here. Your emotion, Mary, that allows that impregnation through virgin consciousness, meditation, that sets astride that which is the mule, your stubborn nature, and totally is led then into the place of the manger, that holy place of the solar plexus, where through virgin consciousness, the child is born, the Christ is born. And the star is in the east, the light then comes from the right hemisphere, and the wise men come from the east, wisdom comes from the right hemisphere. That's what it means. Which is, yes sir, you have a, you have a statement there. Wait a minute, wait, uh, you have to be on TV. You're going to say these things. Yes. Well, what I was, you know, as you said that now, as they bow down, yes. they're seeking, they're meditating. Yes. But apparently, they're not seeking to be filled with light. What do you think their prayers are as they bow down? It's exactly the, I, I can't really go into a dissertation about exactly what their prayer may be, but their worship is to God. And they are instructed from the most ancient of times to subdue themselves and to face the East. I believe in my heart that in the same way that the Jews would kill animals uh, in the early point and then find out, no, it's not the animal, the four-legged animal that should be killed. It's the two-legged animal that is in here that should be killed. And so I believe without taking anything away from their practice or their ritual that the significance of it, as I said, yes, you must kneel and humble yourself and bow down and face the east. This is certainly and simply their way of stopping everything and directing themselves to God in the same way that we do. We may come here and sit on the floor and go home or listen to music or whatever, and they stop on several times a day and then move in their physical way to recognize the existence of God. We are praying for peace. Yes. How can they be praying for peace with their, the, the, the way they are acting? I mean... Uh, okay, well, I, I, you know, when we... They when we be praying to God to win the war, the holy war. Well, yes, but, but if you look at that, basically it's the same thing that we've done. I mean, I remember seeing not too long ago where Billy Graham went to church with President Bush and Saddam Hussein went to the temple and prayed. So everybody was praying for it, you see? And, of course, we pray for peace, but we can put a missile right down your smokestack if you're not peaceful. I mean, it, it, you know, we'll blow you to pieces if, if, if you're not making the kind of peace that we want to make. So it, it depends, basically. I think what you're saying is true, but I think, on the other hand, what, after we got done looking at that side and what they've done, and then look at our side with what we've done, we have to say, right back to square one, both of us have misinterpreted this true God of peace, and we've got to come to grips with ourselves and not worry about uh, physical demonstrations of this, but uh, a real spiritual demonstration of moving inside of ourselves and allowing that mind to be changed, you know. Um, it, it, it's very, very difficult, especially, and of course, I can just speak as an opinion. I, I have no 
no way of knowing. And your guess is as good as mine. But I think it's very difficult for a culture sometimes that looks at a big culture like us, a big powerful culture like we are, and realizes that they're not our favorite. We have another favorite. Our favorite is Israel. We, we have a lot of our... I've earned 40,000 Americans are living right now full-time in Israel. That's where they live. So that's our favorite. And when you are on the outside looking in and you say that's our favorite, you will very much resent. You know, I think what we have to do if we're going to come to grips with this problem is to start educating ourselves a little more on what you said. And I think your question is extremely very good, and I really couldn't answer it. And that is, what are they doing? What do they mean? Let's find out. And, and I think that's the thing. We know about the Jewish culture. We know about the Torah. And we know about you know the, the, the temple and the synagogue. But we don't know about these people. We've kept ourselves aloof from them. And we don't really know what they're doing or how they're praying. Um, so I, I think basically what I'm trying to say is it's time that we get to know and get to understand and get to kind of embrace them and let them feel that, yes, we, we love you and your God is the same as our God and their God and every bit is good and, and stop all of the, the insanity. But it's a, it's a real good question, I think. And I, I was talking to Mary about that this morning, Al. And Mary um, is our, one of our Sunday school instructors here for the children and with Joan and I was talking to her. And we're going to start next week or the week after whenever in instructing the children here on these religions and, and how these people worship and, and what they mean in their worship. You know, you know, it's interesting what you say, too, and I think this is a point, if I could make it, that indeed we look at some of the warriors of that side and say, oh, my God, how could they do this? But what struck me in watching some of the television, there was a house in Iraq that was bombed out, and there's a young girl coming out looking at the rubble. She had a pair of slacks on, a pair of, like, these Nike shoes like you have on, a sweater, it's like, and she's standing there, and she could be the, the girl across the street, you know? And, 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 of course, she has, you know, just like you and me, we have nothing to do with this. What do we know, you know? Uh, it, I, you know, I, I, I guess all of our warriors somehow, um, I think we can look at and, 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 and ask, you know, why. But uh, it's a good question, and I, and I think it points up the need for, for our children especially, and maybe for ourselves too. You might want to expand this, that we all begin to learn some of these other cultures and other religions and get and get these fears put down. It's a good question. And I think we have to practice it and understand it and, and come up with the answers. Well, with that, we'll bid adieu, which is, I believe, French for bon voyage <laughs> or something like that. And I just wanted to thank you for sharing this.